Well, as you know, if you were here last week, on the Sunday mornings, I'm here until Christmas. We're taking up the Psalms again from Psalm 16 and working consecutively through them uh, as far as we can get by the end of the year. We did Psalm 16 last week and so this morning we come to Psalm 17. Please open the word of God at Psalm 17. Now the Psalms are very wonderful. They centre not only on the praise of God but also on the experience of the believer. It doesn't matter what experience you have, you will find a psalm fitting that experience and to help you in that experience. A believer's experiences are very diverse. Some experiences come from outside, some are questions of our hearts. There are times of elation and joy and rejoicing. There are times of depression and disorientation and doubt and distress and there's everything in between. Some of the experiences of the believer are not pleasant. Psalm 17 is about an unpleasant experience. And so we'll call it, when you are attacked, because David was attacked, not just because he was king, but because he was a godly king. The Holy Spirit has led him to pen this psalm, and it's just the psalm you need and I need when we are attacked. So we come to Psalm 17, when you are attacked, And we'll see that there are three great things in this psalm which we should consider. Now, first of all, we will see an evil environment. David, in verse 11, says, They have now surrounded us. He's conscious, as all godly people are, that he's in a minority. And sometimes, as we all know, the minority is so small, there's only one of us. He's conscious that the wicked out there are more numerous than he is. He's conscious that wherever he walks, there's wickedness in front of him and behind him on each side. It's an evil environment. He is surrounded with it. Who are these people who surround him? Let's see their philosophy of life. It's there in verse 14. It talks about men of the world. Men of the world who have their portion in this life. You cut the cake, you ask which is your portion, that's what's for you. Men of the world, when they think about what is for them, they think about the world and this life. Their hopes, their desires don't go any further than the 70 or 80 years that they'll have on the planet and what this life has to offer them. That's their philosophy. Of course, what they don't realize is the rest of the verse. Men of the world who have their portion in this life and whose belly you fill with your hidden treasure. They eat their meals and don't say grace, but it's nonetheless God who gives them the meals. That's a treasure. It's hidden from them, but it is God's treasure. They breathe God's air, they fill their lungs with it. They're doing that now as I speak. So, and you are too if you're unconverted or converted. The air is God's gift, it's his creation. He sustains it, they breathe it. It comes from him, they don't thank him for it. But it's, it's hidden from them, but it's God's treasure which is put into their hands. Everything which is in their hands, everything which is on their plate is God's gift to them. But all they're interested in is this world this life, here and now, things, me. But they're conscious, as all people are, that life ends. And that when we go, we leave everything behind. They are satisfied with children. Well, at least I've got children. I will go, but they'll be there. And leave the rest of their substance for their babes. At least I've made something in my life, and when I'm gone, well, at least my children and their children will be able to benefit from what I've managed to acquire. These are the people, and this is the mindset, which is surrounding David and surrounding us. This is the evil environment. Now, let's see the character of these people. We read of it in verse 9. 
They're called the wicked. We read of it in verse 13. At the end of the verse, once more, they're called the wicked. Wickedness, ladies and gentlemen, is loving what God has created more than loving God. As Paul puts it, it's loving the creature more than the creator. That's what wickedness is. And once the heart is engaged in wickedness, then everything else, of course, is perverted by it. It's loving what God has made more than God himself. That's who they are. That's their character. And so we read in verse 10, it says in the New King James Version, they have closed up their fat hearts. It's not a good translation. They are enclosed in their own fat. Would be a better translation. You ever seen a fat animal just sitting there, purring in its own, what is it, in its own fat? Self-satisfied. Smug. Pleased with itself. That's the picture that David is using. You see, they're men of this world, women of this world. They love what God has made rather than God. And they're rather pleased with themselves. They're rather satisfied. That's why they speak like they do in verse 10. With their mouths they speak proudly. And of course, pride is self-centeredness. So when they speak, they speak, if not about themselves, at least about what interests them. Their thoughts are centering round them as they speak. And of course, what a man thinks in his heart eventually comes out on his lips. These are the people who surround David. These are the people who surround us. That's the environment in which he finds himself here in Psalm 17. And we on this Sunday and every other day. Now what is their attitude to David? Look at verse 7 at the end of the verse. He describes these people as those who rise up against them, against the godly. So there is movement, but there they are self-satisfied in their mindset, with their worldview, their particular philosophy, but here is somebody else who is different And now there is a reaction. We see them rising up against him. Look at verse 9. The second half of the verse. Deadly enemies who surround me. The wicked who oppress me. So they want to do him down. How much do they want to do him down? Well, verse 9 is clear, isn't it? Deadly enemies. Verse 4 is clear. There the wicked is called the destroyer. And verses 11 and 12 are even more clear. They have now surrounded us in our steps. They have set their eyes. Have you got the picture now of the lion or the lions creeping up on their prey? They've got their eye on one thing. Crouching down to the earth. But the lion doesn't take its eye off the animal that is going to attack. Like a lion that is eager to tear his prey. And as a young lion lurking in secret places. Frankly, unconverted men and women want David dead. And frankly, as we live our Christian life, we are living amongst men and women and boys and girls, sadly, Who would prefer it if everybody was like them? Who would prefer it if there was no godliness and no God? And as you know, the only way you can get rid of godliness is by making godly people like yourself or by destroying them. Because godliness exists in people. It's not just an abstract concept which like a cloud blows round the world and settles here and settles there. Godliness exists in young people and men and women. Godliness is seen in schools and factories and offices and places of study and homes and neighbourhoods and extended families. And when people are enclosed in their own fat, thinking of this world and not thinking of anything beyond it, 
Another life which comes in and challenges that way of thinking. Another life which reminds them of the God they know in their hearts is more than they can stand. And if they can't make the godly life themselves, which is the first thing they will try to do, then they will try and get rid of them altogether. That is the environment in which the Christian life is lived. Some people would prefer that it wasn't so. Sometimes the idea is given to young Christians that their Christian life will prosper better in some form of greenhouse. But the godly life is always lived in that environment. God's plants don't grow in greenhouses. They grow out in the storm and the wind. They grow out They grow out where the sun beats down and where the floods come. That's where the Christian life is lived. All through history there have been Christians who've tried to retreat from the evil environment. Of course they found evil in their own hearts, which other Psalms will deal with. Some Christians have built pillars 60, 100 feet high and lived on the top for 30 or 40 years. That's amazing, isn't it? Wouldn't suit some of us, so vertigo. Some Christians have retreated to remote islands. It's no accident that on those little islands off the Welsh coast you see the old Celtic crosses. Some Christians have hidden away in monasteries or Bible colleges. Nothing wrong with Bible colleges. If they teach the truth, it's not a place to hide. Some Christians don't make any friends except with Christians because they want to retreat completely from the evil environment. They think that the Christian life cannot be lived where there is hostility. And yet, ladies and gentlemen, it's the only place where a believer has ever been called to live. So we see an evil environment. Now, the second thing we see is a godly man. If I could retreat, I would be more godly You wouldn't. If circumstances were more favourable, I'd be a stronger Christian. You wouldn't. I'm a weak Christian because of what I have to put up with. You're not. You can be a godly man, you can be a godly woman, you can be a godly person in an evil environment. And all godly people who've ever been godly have been godly in an evil environment. To to blame your circumstances or to think that if you were somewhere else you would be a better Christian than you are is actually the devil's lie. We can prove he's a godly man in four ways. First of all, he's a man of prayer. Every verse in this psalm is addressed directly to God. Even verses 10 and 11 and 12 actually are spoken in God's presence. Here is a man in an ungodly world, in an evil environment, who nonetheless is addressing God. He's maintaining communion with God. How about me? How about you? We can prove he's a godly man because he's a man of integrity. Look at the words which are used in the psalm. Verse 1. He talks about a just cause. A cause which God would approve of. A cause which reflects the character of God. That's David's cause. Look at verse 1. He talks of lips which are not deceitful, because the lips around him were. Look at verse 2. He talks about things that are upright, which means exactly what it says, of course. Something lean, or different forms of evil. But things are upright point only to God. Look at verse 3. You have tested my heart. You have visited me in the night. And would God give strange and wonderful spiritual experiences? Would he unveil himself in a particular way to an evil person? You have visited me in the night. Oh, those precious moments that David knew of communion with God 
when there was nobody around. But you have tested my heart. You have visited me in the night. You have tried me and have found nothing. Nothing evil. I don't think there's any of us here that could say what David says here. Look at verse 3, the end of the verse. I have purpose that my mouth shall not transgress. So in his lips, in his heart of hearts, in his behaviour, he's just and upright and truthful. He's a man of integrity. He's different. Verse 4. Concerning the works of men, by the word of your lips I have kept myself from the paths of the destroyer. Uphold my steps in your paths. Have we got the picture? The world is walking that way. David walks over there. Everybody says, that's the way. But he goes there. Rather, he goes there. They say, let's go along this route. But the way they go is the way not to go. Their standards, their ethics, their behaviour, their ideas, their ambition, their love. It all meets with a negative in David. Because he must go a completely different way altogether. He is distinct. There are different paths through life. And he can't choose the path of the majority. In verse 6. And seven, we see where his heart really is. He's a man of faith. Verse six, I have called upon you, for you will hear me, O God. And in verse seven, he talks about God who saves those who trust in you. So he's a man of prayer. He's a man of integrity. We can prove he's a godly man. There's a third way. He's a man of strong desire. And his desire is spiritual. Let's go through it again. Look at verse 1. Hear a just cause, Lord. Attend to my cry. The wicked around are trying to amass their goods, enjoy their pleasures, live this life, and blow the grave. But here is this man. Hear. Attend to my cry. Verse 6, I have called upon you, incline your ear to me, hear my speech. They've got strong desires, and he's got strong desires. They've got rich emotion, and he's got rich emotion. But theirs is spent on themselves and this life, and his is a yearning, a yearning to be heard by God. He has strong desires. Verse 2, He's asking that God will vindicate him. Of course. Because the wicked spread lies about us. The history of the Christian church is filled with the different lies which have been spread about Christians. Even today we're supposed to be obscurantists, ostriches with our head in the sands. We switch off our mind and flip off. We fly away in a great albatross. We never think about anything. Our message has no relevance and we live for ourselves and our own spiritual experience and pleasure. And the lies continue to be spread. He asked for God to vindicate. Look at verse 5. Strong desire. He can't walk God's way on his own. He hasn't got strength to lift his thigh to take one step. Uphold my steps in your paths. Even if he gets on the right path, he's likely to slip off it. Uphold my steps in your paths, that my footsteps may not slip. Oh, David, what does he desire? His strong desire is that God will protect and deliver him. The language is very bold. Verse 7, show your marvellous loving kindness by your right hand. That's God in action. Oh, you who save those who trust in you from those who rise up against them. Keep me as the apple of your eye. Hide me under the shadow of your wings from the wicked who oppress me, from my deadly enemies who surround me. 
Verse 13. Arise, O Lord, confront him, cast him down, deliver my life from the wicked with your sword, with your hand from men, O Lord. And of course his prayer in verse 13 is particularly bold. As, as a Christian, have you ever prayed verse 13? When you see that our nation kills tens of thousands of its citizens in the womb every year. When you think that it despises hard work and strong values and clear principles. When it looks down upon old age and weakness. Have you ever prayed verse 13? Have you ever asked God to arise? Have you ever addressed God to confront wickedness? Have you ever prayed to God that he will cast it down? Are we so anemic that we dare not pray it? Of course, for evil to be cast down, evil men and women must be cast down. That's why we get the imprecatory psalms. For wickedness to be defeated, wicked people must be defeated. <clears throat> for there to be a change, people must be changed. For wickedness not to proceed, Wicked men and women must be frustrated. We have to pray against them. We'll pray, of course, as Christians, that God in his mercy might save them, give them the new birth, and bring them to truth and righteousness by faith in Jesus Christ. But if they will not repent, we must pray that God will frustrate their plans and cast the wickedness down. And yet it will never be finally cast down. Not in this life. Which is why we come to our fourth proof that he was a godly man. Look at verse 15. Verse 15 is particularly powerful, of course, because it follows verse 14. They are satisfied with children. I shall be satisfied when I awake. They, 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 as for me, they will see their children I will see your face. They will live in wickedness. I will see your face in righteousness. They will be satisfied with children. I will be satisfied when I awake. They will be satisfied by living in this life. I shall be satisfied when I awake in your likeness. And David looks across the world. He longs for wickedness to be cast down. But he knows until the Lord comes, until the curse is finally drawn, until the new heavens and the new earth is at last made, there will always be wickedness stalking the earth. There will be no heaven on earth. And any philosophy which asks for a heaven on earth before the Lord's coming is an ungodly way of thinking. He looks forward to seeing Christ. He looks forward to righteousness. He looks forward to the satisfaction of the eternal state. He looks forward to awaking as a resurrected body and soul in the likeness of his Saviour. His hopes are in heaven. Everything he longs for deepest in his very being will be his when at last he arrives in glory. And that is the hope that he nurses as he walks through this life. So we see an evil environment and a godly man. So we close with a simple secret. Is the world evil? Oh, so evil. Far more evil than we ever, ever have imagined. Because there's so much evil in our own hearts that we cannot actually see how evil the world is. Is it possible to be a godly woman, a godly man? A godly young Christian? Yes. What is the secret? A simple secret. He read his Bible and said his prayers. Verse 4. Concerning the works of men, by the word of your lips, I have kept myself on the path of the destroyer. 
As we walk through the world, we hear a thousand voices. They shout at us from, the, from our papers, from the radios and TVs, and from the conversation of the men and women around us. There is no way that you can block out those voices. But it is possible to turn up the volume and turn down the volume and to hear one voice above all the voices. That voice is found only in the scripture. God deals with us by words. And God deals with us by his word. His word came in previous times by prophets. But then at last he himself came in the person of his son. There were prophets in the early church because the church had to be nourished on Jesus Christ. But when the scripture was complete, there was no further need and all direct revelation has ceased. All that God wishes us to know is inscripturated in his word. And if we're going to be godly in an evil environment, we must put ourselves in the presence of the speaking God. The Bible is not God, but the Bible is the Word of God. Whenever you read it, even if it strikes you or not, God is speaking. The problem is not that God is not speaking, the problem is that you're not hearing. Whichever chapter you open, whichever verse it is, God is speaking. For 1500 years, the Church of Jesus Christ had no printed Bibles. Written Bibles are few and far between. Christians gathered every day to hear the Word of God. Read. There was a system organized in the churches by which the Word of God was read in its entirety at least once a year, and usually the New Testament and Psalms twice. And Christians came to hear the Word of God read. They also came, of course, to hear it preached, expounded, talked about. And they put themselves in the presence of the word of God. Unfortunately, those disciplines ended with the printed Bible, which was a grave mistake. We should be together with the word of God. The Bible was given to the church, not to the individual. Nonetheless, we have the marvelous privilege of printed Bibles. And we have the liberty to read them and the finance to afford them and the education to be able to read. We are incredibly privileged like almost no generation before us and like countless thousands of Christians in the world today. We have that liberty unlike them. We need to put ourselves in the presence of the Word. So that above all the other voices, the eternal word is always sounding. And when we hear a voice saying, do this, don't do this, go there, think that, have that, there is another voice speaking, speaking, speaking. And we are listening. Concerning the works of men, by the word of your lips, I have kept myself from the paths of the destroyer. Uphold my steps in your paths, that my footsteps may not slip. He read his Bible and said his prayers. And in his Bible, of course, he saw and walked with Christ. And said his prayers. The Psalms are prayers. Psalm 17 is his prayer in this evil environment. Thank God that prayer doesn't have to be read from a book. Where would we be if in an evil environment we had to keep stopping, opening our handbag or pocket, find the book and the appropriate page to be able to pray? Prayer is the the rising up of the heart towards God to worship him and to ask for things which are agreeable to him, which are pleasing to him. It can be done by any believer, anywhere, at any time, in any language, or in no language, and sometimes with only groans, which can't be interpreted, 
but the Holy Spirit understands and the prayer is presented perfectly by Christ at God's throne. And so as we listen to him and speak to him, as he communes with us, and we commune with him, as his voice speaks and our heart replies, then we live as godly men and women in an evil environment. Our fourth hymn is the meditation based on Psalm 91. Safe in the shadow of the Lord, beneath his hand and power, I trust in him, I trust in him, my fortress and my tower.